Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you, Eric, for that beautiful prelude. And it's good to be in worship today. Sorry, all you Giants fans. Uh, I kind of went south last. I, I have to apologize. I know there's a lot of Vikings fans around their church. And uh, uh, the Giants took them out last week. And now some sweet revenge for you, I guess. But anyway, uh, not much of a football game last night. But we're glad you've come to worship together with us all today on this beautiful day. Happy New Year, not only for us in the uh, Western calendar, but uh, Lunar New Year. Uh, Chinese New Year, Happy New Year to all of you, the Year of the Rabbit. If you haven't already done so, take the friendship pad on the inside of each row and register your attendance with us, especially if you're visiting with us today. I'd like to get some contact information so we can tell you more about our wonderful church. Well, we have a full service plan for you today around the theme of finding your voice. The gospel story will take us once again to Jesus calling the first disciples. So as you hear the sound of the bells, please uh, stand and be prepared to join in our call to worship. Jesus calls us to praise and prayer, to song and silence. Jesus calls, us to Jesus calls us to hearing and healing, to service and solidarity. Jesus calls us to advocacy and action, to protest and provision. Let us heed the call of God. Let us worship together with joy.
Amen. Thank you for that great singing of that beautiful hymn. One of my favorites, as Eric knows. Thank you for that grand playing of that beautiful hymn. Let us join together in our prayer of confession as we pause to acknowledge our need for God's grace in our lives. We are not perfect. And we did things this week we should not have done, and we left undone those things we should have. So let us first pray together. This is a responsive prayer, a little different than our usual. We usually pray in unison, but this is responsive. I'll lead with the leader, the fine print, and you respond with the bold. Then we'll pause for a moment of personal and silent prayer. Gracious God, you have done so much for us, and yet we offer so little in return. You ask for humility. You ask for willingness. You ask for repentance. You ask for service. Gracious God, you want the best for us. Grant us forgiveness that we, like those first disciples, might hear your call and follow you. Amen. Friends, we have good news to share with one another this Lord's Day. Some of Jesus' first words in the Gospel were, Repent and believe the good news. To repent is to turn around. Let us turn around this day and receive God's grace once again. Friends, believe the good news of the Gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven of all our sin. Amen. Christ be with you. Thank you. And before we pray together, and we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, the psalmist tells us, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Gracious God, we thank you that you are our stronghold. You are our light and our salvation, and we have nothing to fear, not even death itself. We thank you as we have gathered many times in this sanctuary and at other places to celebrate the lives of your saints. We give you thanks that they knew you and loved you and served you. We thank you for the life of Sue Shadane. We thank you for the life of Ginny Drew and Anne Godshall and Elaine Sauzy and others that we have lost recently. We commit them to you, and may their memory inspire us to serve you faithfully all our days as well. We thank you for the opportunity to lift before you the needs of our loved ones. We thank you those, na- those in- situations that have been mentioned out loud and those that we hold in our hearts before you, knowing that you love them more than we do, and you know their needs better than we do. We ask that by your Holy Spirit you'd come and be alongside each of these situations of the, in need of healing, in need of comfort in times of grief, whatever the need may be, may your Holy Spirit be there for them. We thank you for the many joys of our life together as a church family, for all our children, for the creativity in our midst. We thank you for that. We look forward to this new year unfolding before us. Help us to heed your call and to follow you into 2023 and beyond. We pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. first reading today is from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices and shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my, Lord, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off, do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Wow, thank you so much, Anne and Eric, that beautiful gospel song by, has quite a story behind it. Thomas Dorsey was called the father of black gospel music. 1932, he was performing and doing ministry in Chicago and he got word that his wife and newborn child died in childbirth, both. He sat down and penned that song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. As I return to the Gospel, we look to the Gospel of Matthew once again. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 22. Listen as I read the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you, but I seem feel like we're in kind of a transition in the last week or so. I've noticed this uh, shift from that afterglow of Christmas now to looking ahead to the rest of winter and possibly even, hey, spring. Do you realize Groundhog Day is less than two weeks away? I noticed this shift because it took us a while to put away all our holiday decorations this year. Here at the church, we took things down right after New Year's, uh, but there's still, I see a few things every once in a while. There's a wreath on the door down on the west side of the building. And once we take that, trend, that wreath down, transition will be complete. The gospel story makes a significant transition in today's reading. Over the last several weeks of Advent and Christmas, we have heard a lot about John the Baptist, of course. In Luke's Gospel, Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John. Then it is John who is the one who baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. And then in the Gospel of John, the witness of John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord is front and center. And then today, there's an important transition. The camera moves from John to Jesus. The Gospel reading today begins with these words. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. So John exits stage left, and Jesus now takes the spotlight, which is exactly what John would have wanted. His entire purpose in life was to straighten and smoothen the road for Jesus, the Messiah, the light who was to come into a dark world. John had found his voice it was time for Jesus to find his. And as if to complete this transition, the gospel story makes one more reference to the familiar words of the prophet Isaiah that we heard a lot during Advent. Remember hearing the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light? Of course, that light is Jesus. And as he begins to find his voice, he starts with the foundational message, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay, the stage is now set and the story begins in earnest. And it begins with Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee. 
Notice Jesus is always on the move. So many chapters begin with transitions like Jesus was walking along the sea or when Jesus had come down from the mountain and after getting into a boat crossing the sea or at the time Jesus walked through the grain fields. Jesus was finding his voice and part of his calling was to share his message with as many people as possible. So he was always on the move. He never stood still. I love that peaceful image of Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee. I love walking along water, whether it's the Hudson River or the shores of Lake Erie where we lived or the Pacific Ocean on the West Coast. I've always found it calming and nurturing to my soul to walk along water. I can hear the voice of God more clearly when I'm near water. Maybe that was true for Jesus because much of his ministry took place along or near and even on the Sea of Galilee. I've been there and walked on that shore. Many of you have as well, I'm sure. It's a beautiful body of water surrounded by mountains. Today it is mostly a vacation spot for tourists, but in Jesus' day it was a working lake. Fishermen would line the shore repairing nets and sending out boats. The Gospel says that as Jesus walked along the shore, he saw Peter and Andrew casting their nets into the sea. Without any small talk at all, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Now this is one of the most familiar lines of the Bible that you probably remember in a different way. <laughs> in Sunday school we learned the song, I will make you fishers of men. How many know that? Fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. And we had the motions to go with it. You know, we cast a line and roll it in. Well, that's not how they caught fish back then. But that's okay. We got the idea like I was trying to teach the kids. Jesus wants us to use our gifts and make a difference in people's lives. Jesus wanted us to find our voice and use it to fish for people. For generations, the gist of this message was evangelism. I will make you fishers of men and women was a call to evangelize and save souls. And that may be, but it was much more than that. Part of Jesus' message was to repent and believe the gospel. But even if the, in this story, if we jump ahead to the end of this little story, Jesus went throughout Galilee proclaiming the good news and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. To fish for people is to use our voice and offer words of encouragement, but it is also to use our hands and our feet to go where we are needed and touch the lives of people. Jesus cured diseases and sicknesses, and we tend to think of just physical disease, but Jesus calls us to heal all the diseases and every sickness. We are called to heal prejudice, injustice, poverty, and discrimination. Those are diseases that we need to be cured of just as much as diseases of the body. Another thing to note about this call of Jesus on Andrew and Peter is that he ties their calling to their experience. He didn't say, follow me and I will make you into something you're not. He took who they were with all their gifts and experience and then just redirected them into a life of service to others. They were fishermen, but now he was going to call them to fish for people. And of course that doesn't mean throwing nets over people, but it was an affirmation that they had something to offer. God could use them and their experience and their gifts and make it to make a difference. Then as Jesus kept moving along, he found two more brothers who were fishing from their boat with their father. James and John and their father, Mr. Zebedee, I like to call him, <laughs> were also fishermen. Without much detail, we are told that Jesus called them, and they jumped out of the boat, left their father, and followed him. This story is a reminder that to be followers of Jesus sometimes involves leaving our comfort zone. James and John probably had it made. They were part of a family business that they would inherit someday. But when they heard Jesus' call, they left everything behind to follow him. 
This story from the Gospel is one of a category of biblical literature known as call stories. They go all the way back to the Old Testament with the call of Abraham and Sarah and Moses and the prophets like Elijah and Isaiah. These stories have several elements in common. The person hears the voice of God calling them, and often there is disbelief or even resistance. Moses, remember, protested that he had anything to offer. He did not think the people would listen to him. Go call my brother Aaron. He speaks much better than I do. But Moses found his voice, didn't he? So in the gospel, the disciples hear the voice of Jesus, and they leave everything and follow him. And they too resist along the way, like when Peter later denied that he even knew Jesus. But in the end, they follow. They find their voice and use it to spread the good news, even after Jesus is gone from the scene. These call stories have a dual purpose. They're to move the narrative of the gospel along, of course, and they introduce characters within the storyline. But they're also intended to invite the reader and the hearer of the gospel, you and I, to find our voice, too. The call of Jesus to follow me echoes down to us across the ages. Just as Jesus called Peter and Andrew to shift their focus from fish to people, so God is calling you and me to shift our focus. There are people around us who need our gift and to need to hear our voice. We don't have to go back to the first century to find examples of people who have found their voice. One of the most powerful examples in recent years has been that amazing environmental activist Greta Thunberg. She was in the news again this week being detained for raising her voice in opposition to coal mining in Germany. My point is not to debate the wisdom of that particular issue, but to lift her up as an example of someone who found her voice in a powerful way at a young age. At 16, she got the attention of the entire world when she addressed the United Nations Climate Change Conference. And now that she has found her voice, nothing is going to shut her up if you saw her in the news again this week. And we don't have to look too far away for examples of people who have found their voice and made a difference. I want to take a moment to tell you about someone right here in our church family. She has found her voice as an advocate for the wrongly imprisoned, and what a difference she has made. That person, some of you may have guessed, is my dear wife, Elizabeth. On the 31st of this month, she and I will join a team of lawyers and family to welcome home a young man named Armand McLeod, who has been in prison for 28 years for a crime he didn't commit. It's quite a story that might be told by Dateline or the New York Times someday, but it started right here in our church. When he first moved to New York, Elizabeth was looking for where she could make a difference and find her voice. I was busy with my job here at the church and she was looking for where God wanted to use her. We attended all kinds of meetings of various social justice organizations in Westchester and New York City. We heard interesting speakers like Angela Davis and Cornell West and others. They were interesting, but little did we know that a simple list put up by Louise, Louise Crawford of our PCMK Women's Association would lead her to our calling. In December 2012, Louise put up a list of names of incarcerated men and women who indicated they would like to receive a Christmas card. Elizabeth took the name of a man in Attica Prison and a woman here in Bedford. And while it was easy, easy to visit her friend in Bedford, it was a challenge to visit this young man. We had to plan our summer vacations around visits to the various prisons up and down the state as they kept moving him around. As she learned more about his story, she became an advocate for him. And five years ago, she began to write to law firms who indicated they might be willing to take on wrongful conviction cases pro bono. She wrote over 30 letters and only a few bothered to write back to say they were sorry they were unable to help. Then through a miracle of its own, one of those letters reached the right person who knew someone in the prosecutor's office of integrity, the integrity unit. And to make a long story short, the file was referred to two top law schools and they have become his advocates pleading his case 
first for parole, and then ultimately for complete exoneration. Elizabeth heard the call and found her voice. And a young man who had given up all hope is going to walk free. I say young man because he seems young to me, but he'll be almost 50 when he can finally begin his life again, having spent the prime of his life behind prison walls. She found her voice by something as simple as offering to write a Christmas card. She found her voice, and as I prepared for this sermon, I thought of so many others in our church family I could tell you about who have found their voices. People like Carmen Emery, who has been an advocate for the homeless in our community for many years through the emergency shelter program. People like Brian Bubb, who has given tremendous leadership to the Mount Kisco Interfaith Food Pantry, which has hired a new executive director and is moving forward in some exciting new ways. People like Chris Thorin and Linda Clem and others who teach Sunday school each week. People like Ann Carpenter who share their musical gifts and so many more. They have found their voice. How about you? Have you heard God's call on your li life? Have you, heard your vo have you found your voice? You probably have, even if you don't know it. If you stop and think about it, you have gifts and skills that you can offer to others through the church or another organization, or maybe it's just an opportunity to make a person a difference in one person's life, neighbor to neighbor. As we transition from the holiday season into the rough and tumble of this new year, may we take time to listen once again for those words, follow me and I will make you help people. And then stay open to what that means for you and you too will find your voice. And believe me, the world needs to hear your voice. Amen. Let us continue to worship God as ushers come to receive our tithes and offerings. Willa there. We'll have a baptism next Sunday. Come and join us for the annual meeting and a baptism in worship. A meeting is after worship, but Rob and Lindsay here with little baby Willa. We'll look forward to that next Sunday. There's a flyer about Eric's uh, opera that he told you about on the table out in the narthex there. And then do come and join us for that class if you can to get a cup of coffee and fellowship for a few moments. And then about 1130, we'll start down in the Aiken room. And uh, Wayne has got himself together. <laughs> he wasn't feeling well, but he's here and ready to share with us. So now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.